Britain offers to slaughter 15,000 cattle a week for the next five years to wipe out BSE. More people have fallen ill with a stomach bug that's thought to have been caused by drinking contaminated water. The number of suspected food poisoning cases in central Scotland has risen to 181. 91 of these are confirmed as Why do governments make laws about things that affect our health? Today, government controls the safety of the food we eat, the water we drink, and the houses we live in. The government sees our health as an important part of its job, but in the past, governments did not see health as their responsibility. Why did things change? naked with the blankets left from the last one she goes in that van she's never coming back do you want me to stay just keep the kids out they're down by the river just keep them out till it's over in the cellar of number 23 back Irk street Anne hannah Eight-year-old daughter of an unemployed weaver was dying because of the cholera epidemic that had hit the poorest parts of the city. We know about Anne because of a local doctor, Henry Galter. He wrote a book about the cholera epidemic, which gave us a detailed picture of working life in Manchester in 1832. We had known the disease was coming. It had swept across Europe like a like an enemy no army could hold back. It was in London, Belfast, Liverpool, Glasgow. We knew it would not pass us by. So two months ago our Board of Health inspected the poorest parts of the town. And what we found there were such scenes of filth, crowding, disgusting habits, drunkenness, and in some districts, such wretchedness and hunger. So much that when the report was finally published, many of our more comfortable citizens said that we'd slurred the good name of the city, painting a picture quite so grim. As the epidemic spread, Golter plotted the first 200 cases on a map, and he visited the families involved to question them to try to pin down the cause of the disease. He knew that cholera affected poor people more than it affected rich people. In Back Oak Street, three days after the death of Anne Hannah, he found her younger sister Margaret was sick too. Margaret Hannah, aged four, very delicate, half famished, seized Monday, July 23rd, 7 a.m. I'm sorry to ask these questions at such a time, you understand? No, she'd not been with her sister. Not when I was sick. But no, it was too quick. Margaret were out playing at the time. Uh, and then in the afternoon, they came for her, for Anne, to go to the hospital. Don't know who told them. It was for the best. So, 
Margaret never saw her sister again. No contact, then. Has she eaten? Margaret. My husband's not worked these two months. If I have food, it goes to me eldest. I gave Anne porridge the night before she went, and buttermilk. And now I see that we're wasted. Margaret's had nothing. No one at this stage knew exactly what caused cholera. Some people thought it was contagious, but you caught it from other people. But people like Galter had made the connection between cholera and the poor conditions in which these people lived their lives. The poor quality of the food they ate, the overcrowded housing and the bad sanitation. Many of the streets Galter found cholera victims in were streets of back-to-back -back houses. Many doctors believed these houses were the cause of diseases like cholera because they believed bad air was trapped in them. In fact, the real problem was the lack of running water, drains, lavatories and refuse collection. This house, for instance, number six, Jordan Street. It's blocked in from the side and the rear. There's only one source of air and light. The rubbish they have to carry through the house to the front, but because the streets are so narrow, the rubbish carts can't fit, so the filth just sits there. The distance here, look, between two facing houses, just 14 foot. Each house had just two rooms, one up, one down, and the cellars, some of which were as small as 12 foot by 14, the landlords rented out separately to make even more money. I have seen whole families, six, seven, eight, sleeping on the floor, no furniture, in one cellar. The children, half naked, half starved, and the smell of it, it's indescribable. Where is the privy? Down oh, by the bridge. And how many people use it? Eighty? A hundred? And what sort is it? Is it a hole in the ground or does it overhang the river? A hole. And how often do they come on to take away the filth? Does it overflow? The problem was that until 1830 in Manchester, Builders could build what they liked. There were no building regulations. Workers were flooding in from the countryside to the towns and they needed somewhere to live. The builders wanted to make maximum profits, so they built back-to-backs to cram more and more people into less and less space. These local maps show the speed of development. In 1794, Back Irk Street didn't exist. The area was mainly fields. Over the next 40 years, by 1831, the fields have become narrow streets and courts. How long have you been here? Two months. Our, um, our village were being cleared. They gave us free passage on a barge. Once we'd left, they pulled down our cottage. Did you know what to expect? Work. And did you find work? Susan took me to the foreman. I am lucky. I've got small hands, you know, with spindles. So you stay here with Susan? She has a husband and the children. It, it would not be right. I, I am in uh, lodgings across the way. First it scared me, you know, sleeping with strangers, but now they don't seem so strange. Men and women? No. No, it, it is a decent house. Well, not like some, but Mrs Hopkins has seven men and women in the one room and not the same surname between them. You have done well. Throughout Britain, over 31,000 people died in this cholera epidemic, 900 of them in Manchester. Most of them 
lived in houses like this, built next to stables, slaughterhouses, factories. Because there were no building regulations, builders weren't forced to provide sewers, toilets or water supplies. Many poorer families had to collect water from canals or rivers. People even stole water from private water pumps, then used it so sparingly that it became even dirtier. Over 30 years later, by 1867, it was accepted that the cholera germ was in the water, something Henry Galton never knew. But his work helped to prove the link between disease and poor living conditions. It seems to me, when you examine the conditions of our working poor, that the truly remarkable question is why so few should have died. Walk down Back Oak Street, for instance, and note how outside the very door of number 23, in which house Anne and Margaret Hannah died, the sewer bubbles up through the crumbling masonry, flooding the street in a stinking mass of excrement. Now, is this not the perfect soil in which disease would grow? Frankly, I can see no reason all things considered, why we should have escaped quite so lightly. Do we need government help to make us lead healthy lives? This question was argued over for most of the 19th century. Some people believed that things would sort themselves out. It was up to individuals to look after themselves. Others believed that the government had to take more control of health matters. This drawing was made in 1840 and shows one person's view of life for poor children at the time. The medical problems were serious. In 1842, a report by Edwin Chadwick showed that death rates were extremely high. The average life expectancy for the working classes in Manchester was 17. A rich person could expect to live twice as long. Manchester had been one of the first places to bring in local acts to improve things. All streets are to be at least 24 feet wide and paved and drained by their owners. Of course, it didn't affect the many streets already built, like Back Irk Street. It could only affect new building. Back-to-back -back housing was cheap to build because only one thin wall of brick separated any two houses. In 1844, building back-to-backs was made illegal in Manchester, but we know they were still being built ten years later. This report was made by visiting inspectors from the Manchester and Salford Sanitary Association. They were looking at the street next to Back Irk Street. There is new property at the top of Silver Street in no better condition. The houses are newly built and back-to-back. -back. In these records, the name of the owner has been crossed through, but we can still see it says the property belongs to Alderman Pilling. Alderman Pilling was a member of the local council. It looks as if someone was trying to prevent this information from being made public. In 1848, the government responded to public and official pressure by passing a public health act. But most of its provisions were not compulsory, so many councils didn't do anything. Magazines of the time printed cartoons like this one, showing the local councillors as pigs, ignoring the government's orders out of greed. Many of the middle classes believed that the poor people were responsible for the diseases they caught. They didn't accept that the local councils should try to improve the health of the poor. In 1853, Manchester Council tried to make it illegal to have people living in cellar dwellings but the landlords opposed the measure. This would mean closing nearly all the cellar dwellings and would cause many of us to lose a great deal of income. Some of us would be ruined. Also, it would be very bad for the tenants, as they would have nowhere else to live. The landlords were right. Closing slums did cause problems. Around Back Irk Street, some of the houses were demolished when the railway line came through, as we can see from this map of 1839. 
the housing left got even more overcrowded. This engraving was made by a Frenchman, Gustave Doré, who visited Britain in the 19th century and was amazed at the overcrowding he witnessed. Ten years after the demolitions, in 1849, the Morning Chronicle sent a reporter to Manchester. His report and these images give us some idea of the conditions. The flicker of the candles showed grimy walls reeking with fetid damp which trickled in greasy drops down to the floor. Beds were huddled in every corner. One man was too drunk to get rid of his trousers. In the next cellar slept two boys and a man. One man was lying dressed and beside him a well-grown calf. Sitting upon another bed was an old man, maudlin drunk, with saliva running over his chin. In one of the walls was a little hollow, six feet long, two deep and one high. The death rates were as high as ever. Many people agreed that something had to be done. The next 11 years was a time of much greater action on health reform. In the later 19th century, attitudes changed. Britain became more wealthy through trade and industry. It seemed possible to do more for the people. Manchester finally appointed a medical officer of health in 1867. His name was John Lee. He wanted to get rid of cellar dwellings, get rid of back-to-backs, and get rid of midden privies. We can see how successful he was by looking at the documents that still survive from that time. The rate books for Manchester tell us that cellars were still lived in in 1872. By 1873, all the dwellings are listed as houses. People were no longer living in cellars. Midden privies were literally holes in the ground. The filth had to be dug out, which made it very difficult to remove properly. John Lee brought in a system of pale closets. When people went to the toilet, the waste now went into a bucket beneath the seat, which could be easily removed. Bad housing could not be cured so quickly. These houses were still being lived in in 1944, when this photo was taken. But gradually, houses were demolished throughout the later part of the 19th century. All new streets had to be wide enough so that a cart could get access to the outside toilet, in order to take the waste away. In 1875, the second major public health act was passed. This time, it was not voluntary. All local authorities were legally obliged to bring in reforms. The act was enforced. All local authorities in Britain had to appoint medical officers. Over the next 20 years, housing, water supplies and drainage improved. <laughs> But the reforms were not aimed at curing poverty. Disease and ill health continued to be major problems for the working classes. There is very little film from the beginning of this century, but this was shot in 1946 to show the Victorian conditions that still existed 75 years after the reforms. Published by the local authorities all over the country. Poverty meant that people had to carry on living in very unhealthy conditions. Poverty also meant that people ate cheap food. Tea, bread and margarine were the main foods of the poor. Poor people could not afford to eat the kind of food that provided vitamins, minerals and enough calories to protect them from illness. Keeping clean was still difficult where some 7,000 people are still living in slum conditions. The effect of poverty on health was still very obvious. Council records show an increase in death rates amongst very young children. In 1840, 144 out of every 1,000 babies had died. By 1899, it had gone up to 163 babies in a 1,000 who died before the age of one. By now, working people were beginning to get organised into groups which demanded changes. There were many different political and workers' groups. One of these 
was the Women's Cooperative Guild. The Guild was set up in 1883. It was one of the first organised women's groups and fought for government action in health matters, such as maternity care for pregnant women, childcare, free school meals for the poor, and cleaner streets and housing. Meetings were held all over the country. This is what one member of the Guild wrote. We were taught about vaccinations and death rates. One speaker told us about the public health laws and showed us how the water supply got polluted. After this, we sent up a list of questions to the local health committee. The mayor wasn't very happy about us asking for information, but in the end, he was forced to answer our questions. The British Empire also needed many more able-bodied people. The government wanted to send fit, healthy men to administer the empire. And the armed forces wanted to see health measures brought in. Because during the Boer War, fought from 1899 to 1902, many recruits had not been fit for service. In Manchester, for example, out of 9,000 recruits, only 1,000 were fit for service. As a result of this concern, a parliamentary report was published in 1904. This report asked the government to get rid of overcrowded housing, control smoke pollution, give school children regular medical inspections, set up day nurseries for the children of working mothers, and stop selling tobacco to children. The massive concern from all sections of society meant that the 1906 Liberal government passed new laws. The kinds of laws that had never been passed before, to give poor people help. 1906, school meals were provided for needy children. 1907, schools had to give medicals to children. All births had to be notified to the health visitor. 1908, old age pensions were paid. 1909, the building of back-to-back -back housing was banned across Britain. When the housebreakers take charge, you can really see how rotten these places are. At the beginning of the 19th century, there was little government interference in health matters. By the beginning of the 20th, there was a lot. People began to accept that poverty might be the cause of disease. They also began to accept that poor people could not be blamed for poverty. Today, the government takes responsibility for the nation's health. But the arguments about how much the government should interfere continue. How much government intervention do we need to make us lead healthy lives? affects medicine in many ways. It spreads disease, it causes casualties, it stops research and takes doctors and nurses away from civilians. It also leads to new medical inventions and ways of working. This program looks at surviving records from the First World War, fought between 1914 and 1918, which resulted in 24 million casualties, both soldiers and civilians. Did the war help or hinder medicine? We work for hours and hours without rest, moving from stretcher to stretcher. The overcrowding makes us belief. Between the stretchers, the walking wounded slump, waiting patiently for their wounds to be dressed or for a shot of anti-tetanus. Sometimes a man on a stretcher vomits explosively, spewing over himself and his neighbours. Sometimes they die in their stretchers and we're so busy we don't discover them for hours. 
In the First World War, doctors and nurses were needed as never before. For many men and women, the war was an opportunity to practice as doctors, nurses and ambulance drivers in the very worst conditions. Captain Lawrence Gameson was a medical officer in the Army Medical Corps. He wrote a diary recording his experiences. We work by candlelight. The air is bad. There is blood everywhere. There is little water. No running water, of course. Dressings and filth pile up. We can do so little. We just bandage them up, hand out cups of tea, and give them painkillers if they're screaming. There are so many wounded. We hardly scrape the surface. It was sometimes said the huge number of casualties from battles led to improvements in medicine, especially in surgery. This is what the official history, written at the request of the British government, said about it. The number of battle casualties during the war gave the surgeons a great opportunity for surgical work. And as the years went on, the improvements in method and the skill acquired in dealing with wounds placed war surgery in a position which it had never occupied in the past. But Gameson's diary gives us a different view of how successful surgery was at the front. Sit down, man. You look terrible. I'm fine, fine. Frontline medical officers like Gameson weren't there to carry out operations. Their job was to patch up casualties by bandaging as best they could before sending them back to surgical hospitals, some of which were 20 miles behind the lines, well away from the fighting. But in many cases, surgery would come too late. You look like you need it. Uh, I just had Corporal Peters through. Do you, do you know Peters? He's a regular rocks. He just lay there asking would he play again. Play? Uh, football. He's good. Surprisingly nimble for such a large man. Well, was. I um, cut away the dead flesh, but there's nothing to stop the gangrene. So, we'll just send him back down the line, by which time it'll be too late and the leg will have to go. They could have saved it. Not now. What was it? Um, bullet. Went in the back of the thigh, smashed the bone at the front. There's a hole, three inches thick. <laughs> Maggots swarming already. Couldn't even give the poor sop a shot of tetanus without hurting him more than needles are so blunt. I mean, do you not think they've suffered enough without us skewering them with blunt needles? Get some sleep. Yeah. There's another push at 0600. Four hours. All right. I'll wake you. Before the war, surgeons had been practicing conservative surgery. Instead of removing limbs, they carefully cut away at damaged bone and allowed the limb to heal, so at least the patient didn't lose an arm or a leg. But with such huge numbers of casualties, the dirt, and at first the lack of antiseptics at the front, wounds quickly became septic. And amputations increased dramatically. Many of the official photographs that survive stress the excellence of the medical facilities. But the private written sources 
offer another view. Nobody can ever imagine the fearful wounds these men have. It is not like one sees on the lovely ambulance train arriving in Southampton with slightly wounded men. If I told you some things that come in here, you would be horrified. And it's just as well that England has not seen yet these remains of what were bright young men brought in to die in a few dreadful hours. The War Office felt the horrors of war had to be kept from the British public. There was a great need to keep up morale at home, to make people feel that the war was going well. There was a highly organised system for dealing with casualties. This plan from 1915 shows how casualties either walked or were carried to field dressing stations. They were then sent by horse, ambulance or foot to casualty clearing stations where doctors decided whether they needed to be sent to hospital or not. This system only broke down when the number of casualties became too great. As part of the system, medical cards were introduced in the First World War. This helped doctors to keep track of a patient's medical history. It was a useful development which carried over into civilian life. Before this, doctors didn't automatically pass on information about how patients had been treated. Now, any doctor who came along could find out what the patient's medical history was without asking the patient for it. It's often said that war leads to new inventions and treatments. Blood banks were developed as a response to war. As war weapons grew more deadly, more soldiers received serious injuries. The pressure of casualties meant that army doctors needed vast amounts of blood to cope with the terrible injuries on the battlefield. Before the war, a blood transfusion was only possible if the donor, the person giving blood, was on the spot. The need to be able to store blood led to the introduction of sodium citrate, which meant that blood could be stored and used without the donor being there. The war also made the search for new antiseptics more important. We had never seen wounds become infected as they did in this soil. They quickly developed gangrene, which meant that the skin became grey and bubbled up. It was made worse as the bullets often carried fragments of dirty cloth into the wounds. The doctors were not expecting this problem. The Boer War, 15 years earlier, had been fought on dry, sandy soil in Africa. But the wet, muddy soil in France meant that the wounds became infected very, very quickly. Carol Dakin's solution was a powerful new antiseptic which helped to clean out the wounds and stop infection spreading. It helped to save many lives and limbs. X-rays were not an innovation of the war. They were invented in 1895, but they were widely used at the front to find bullets and examine injuries. So many more people were trained to use X-rays because of the fighting. One area that made major progress during the war was the diagnosis of mental illness. It affected many thousands of casualties, including a high percentage of officers. For the first time, it was widely recognised. Exposure to the horrors of battle placed terrible stress on soldiers. Shell shock became a major problem, both to the army and to the medical profession. Lawrence Gameson's diary records a typical case. I 
was searching a shell hole for a body, scratching around. A couple of shells went overhead, and I saw them fall near two men from B Company who were working in the open. One man fell, and the other was just a boy, really. He escaped, and I sent him back to the dugout for my stuff while I held on with the wounded man. And he was hurt quite badly. Shrapnel. He lost a hand. A lot of blood. Anyway, later I thought the incident was closed. But that night I was called out to see the other one, the boy. He's cold. He was all over the shop. I can't go on. And this is morphia. Sorry. Sorry, small. Now this will help you sleep. So You'll be fine. Ryan, his name was. You know, everyone said he was normal. Always up to scratch. Used to seeing people hit. Seeing his friends hit. But this one isolated incident had, had broken him. He just... Nervous disorders had been treated before the war. But the army didn't have much sympathy. They believed to suffer a nervous complaint showed a lack of moral fibre. Army doctors, like all officers, had a duty to keep discipline. So what you seem to be saying is that if there's no blood, there's no wound. Well, I'm saying it somewhat helps the diagnosis, yes. I had a man came in this morning, holding his guts. Bayonet wound. Now he, I'd say, we should excuse from duty. I think your boy's a coward, Lawrence. I don't know if he's a coward or not. I don't know. All I know is that we've men going over the top every day, and there's something brave. And we're not going to win this war if the whistle blows and boys like him stand skulking on the fire step. It's windy. He had a shock. So, you do your job. You tell him, pull yourself together and over you go. What about concussion? What about concussion? Oh, bomb goes off. They're clear, just. No blood, no shrapnel, but somehow well, they're knocked off balance. Concussed. Do you think they're fit to fight? Except, it's not always as simple as that. And there isn't always a bomb that goes off just at that moment. That's what makes it so difficult. Gunner, so and so. He's been here for months. He's lived through bombardments, advances, retreats. He's tough as old nails. Takes a machine gun post, single-handed. This man is not windy. And then, one day, he's, he's standing in the cookhouse. And he, he sees a sausage pop on the stove. It looks a bit like flesh. And he starts to cry like a baby. And he doesn't stop crying. I'd like to think that man somehow is wounded. I just don't think any of us understand how. As the war progressed, more and more cases of shell shock were reported. 80,000 cases in all. And it wasn't because of physical wounds. Rather, soldiers and officers alike were being made sick by the surroundings, by the sights, sounds and experiences of trench warfare. The War Office was so worried, they tried to limit the damage. In 1917, just before the Battle of Passchendaele, they tried to ban the use of the words shell shock. The medical officer will not record any diagnosis he will enter the letters NYDN, not yet diagnosed, nervous, and will note any definitely known facts about the true origin or the previous history of the case. In no circumstances whatever will the expression shell shock be used verbally or be recorded. We have to call all our nervous patients either wounded or sick. And all the time, there's this pressure to call them sick because only the wounded will get a pension. Our judgment has always been questioned. And you think you're a doctor, and it's your job to find out what's wrong. And then some memo comes through and it dawns on you. No, it's not. Your job's to close your eyes and pass them fit for duty. But the war did help the study of mental illness. Because soldiers with nervous disorders were an embarrassment and bad for morale, 
many were taken away from the front line and kept in special camps. After Passchendaele, one camp was set up holding 5,000 men. Here, though attitudes were basically unsympathetic, some doctors did take the opportunity to study nervous disorders further. As interest grew, specialist hospitals were set up back in Britain. This footage shows victims of shell shock being treated at Netley Hospital in Southampton. The treatments developed here were written up in The Lancet. They included role play, talking and the use of electric shocks to persuade the limbs to work again. Our experience has shown that prolonged re-education is unnecessary and we are now disappointed if complete recovery does not occur within 24 hours. Men are now fit to return to duty or to earn their living in civilian life in a few weeks instead of having to be invalided from the service. The emphasis was still on finding a quick cure and not paying a pension. Many patients with shell shock were accused of malingering or cowardice, the penalty for which could be death. The boy, Ryan, now, three days after the incident with the shell, he was himself again, or seemed to be. But then word came down the wire there was to be a push, and the bombardment started again to soften up Jerry before the boys went over the top. And in all the noise and confusion, Ryan just left. He just walked away. The next day, after the push was over, half his mates were dead, he was found five miles behind the line, sitting with his feet in the ditch, holding his rifle like a fishing rod. When asked what he thought he was doing, he said, I'm waiting for a bite. They put him in lockup and charged him with cowardice. Where are we? What do you mean, where are we? He's soft. Tell me. Wait for Dad. He said when he gets back, we can go to the brook. Do you want to come? Who? Who am I? Who are you talking to? Joe. Who's Joe? Your brother, Joe? Joe. I always go fishing on Sunday. I'm not your brother. Do you not want to come in? I've seen malingerers. But I don't think I'm green. I mean, maybe one or two have slipped past me, I don't know. But this boy was not malingering. And he didn't know he'd left the battle, left his mates. And now he would be tried, and if found guilty, he could be shot. Officially, no sentence of death could be carried out without the approval of a medical officer. As the Army Commander-in-Chief, Field Marshal Haig, made clear, 